The summer before my freshman year of college, my uncle called me up and asked if I would be willing to help him fix up his cabin during the summer's warm weather. I eagerly agreed because I hadn't been to the cabin since I was a little guy, so I was more than excited to go back. Plus, I was basically the only adolescent in the family, and I surely wasn't going to turn down my elderly uncle's request to help with physical labor. A week before I was supposed to head out for the cabin, I got another call from my uncle. Unfortunately, it turned out he had just suffered a pretty severe heart attack. The guy was as strong as an ox and wouldn't let anything knock him down on his ass, so I was pretty surprised to hear that he wasn't going to work on the cabin that summer. He assured me that it would be okay and we could just do it next summer, but I had just turned 18. I was young, dumb, and full of, well, you know. Anyways, I practically begged him to let me go to work on the cabin myself, and eventually he did give in. My uncle sent me a list of the tasks and instructions to help complete them. He only anticipated me being up there for about a week or two at max. However, when I saw the list, I was immediately concerned. It was obvious that my uncle had overestimated my abilities and clearly held nothing back and gave me every task he could think of. I had no idea how to do half the things on that list, so I was expecting to be at the cabin a lot longer than expected. I was wrong. The road to the cabin is long, windy, treacherous, and made of loose dirt. On one side is a large rock face, while the other side looks straight down into a gorge filled with lush green pine trees. I understand that I'm explaining this in a way that makes it sound rather dangerous, and that is true, but I truly can't emphasize the beauty of the landscape. Whether it was the risk of driving off the edge of a cliff, or the excitement of laying eyes on the cabin for the first time in ten years, I was sweating. I could feel the little beads dribble down my side, in almost a ticklish manner chilling my torso. After around 20 minutes of following that daunting path, I came around the final corner and there staring back at me was the cabin that I loved so dearly. Holy crap, did that thing look rough? You know the cabin from the Evil Dead? Yeah, like that. I immediately knew that I had a lot of work cut out for me, but part of me was ecstatic at the thought of completing such difficult chores. I imagined bragging to all my new friends I'd make at college about the time I single-handedly fixed my family's cabin. When I got out of the truck, it was sometime in the late afternoon. I knew I wouldn't be able to get much done that night, so I walked around the property and did a brief inspection of the area. Everything seemed to be just fine. I remember seeing a cluster of grayish fur on one of the trees. I suppose it could have been from a deer, but now looking back at it, I think it was foreshadowing the encounter I would have later that night. After I finished my walkthrough, I wandered over to the small babbling brook that runs along the side of the property and dipped my right hand into the cold mountain stream. I cupped my hand and scooped out some of the water into my mouth. The water was clean, clear, and tasted real. Unfortunately, not many people have the privilege of tasting clean, natural water. As I stood up from the creek, I thought about how lucky I was to be there and for the first time, I really took in my surroundings. While I scanned the tree line and hills that surrounded the cabin, I suddenly realized that the entire area looked different from how I remembered it. I mean, it all looked the same, but so much more dead. Not only was the cabin way past the point of being rustic, but many of the trees surrounding the property had been turned a sickly brownish gray and a lot of the grass had either died or have been washed away by the heavy rains that frequented the area. While it made me sad to see, it didn't raise any alarms. My dad had grown up in Montana and had educated me on pine beetles when we visited his hometown. They were a species of beetle that came from British Columbia and infected many of the forests of the northwestern United States. So, I merely assumed that they were behind the death of so many of the trees and the cabin had simply succumbed to years of neglect after my elderly uncle could no longer make frequent trips up to the mountain. At this time, my stomach growled so loud I thought it might have been a frog hiding somewhere in the creek. Upon realizing that it came from my gut, I promptly made my way to the truck, unloading some of the food and gear, and then headed for the fire pit that sat in front of the cabin. 
at least what was left of the fire pit. It clearly hasn't seen use in the last 10 years either. All but two of the small stones which created an almost perfect circle still stood in place, and unsurprisingly, there were no charred pieces of firewood or piles of light gray ash to prove that fires had once been common here. So, I gathered some more rocks from the creek and completed the ring and made my way over to the stockpile of firewood that remained behind the cabin. Thankfully, the wood was covered so rain never got to it, but the thought of a large black widow digging its sleek fangs into my flesh sent chills down my spine. There were all too many spider webs, but thankfully no spiders in sight, so I grabbed four medium pieces of wood and made my way back to the fire pit. After stacking the wood over some crumpled up newspapers I had brought with me, I tossed a match in and took a deep breath as I sat on one of the large logs that bordered the fire. I waited a while for the flames to die down before I skewered a hot dog and began roasting it over the open fire. Nothing beats that feeling. A long day of driving out in the wilderness topped off with a delicious Hebrew national cooked over a wild flame. Yeah, needless to say, 18-year-old me felt like he was on top of the world about right then. I chowed down on my meal, munching on some chips and sipping on a beer I may or may not have snagged from the fridge before my father could interject. Upon filling my once empty stomach, a cold breeze caused me to shiver, duplicating the sensation of someone breathing down your neck. I swiveled around almost instinctively, and while I didn't explicitly see anything right then, I was pretty sure I heard some branches crunch under something heavy. The feeling of being on top of the world suddenly faded as through the true feeling of being alone started to set in. As fast as I could throw the remaining food into my bear canister, tied a knot on top of the canister, and flung it over a nearby branch. There weren't any grizzlies in central Oregon as far as I knew, but having a mama bear and her two cubs waltz into my campsite was not my agenda, so I took the necessary precautions regardless. I had originally planned on sleeping inside the cabin, but when I saw the state of the cabin, I quickly decided on sleeping in the truck. Despite being summertime, the sky was quickly flooded with darkness. I grabbed a bucket of water from the creek and put the fire out all the way before making my way for the truck. I sat in the passenger seat, reclined the chair as far back as I could, threw a blanket over myself and closed my eyes for the night. I woke up in the middle of the night, surrounded by blackness and the pounding of rain against the windshield. Initially, I assumed that was the rain which had awoken me, but I was proven wrong when I heard a blood-curdling screech coming from the trees. I shot up out of my prone position, made sure all the doors were locked, and put my keys into the ignition. As soon as the truck started, I powered its headlights on. Nothing. I pushed the left lever forward and toggled the truck's blinding head beams on. Nothing. But then, I saw movement. I couldn't tell what it was at first, but I thought I could make out antlers, no different from that of an elk. But then, it stood up on two legs. The lights caught the creature's eyes, reflecting back an equally blinding light. It raised its wolf-like head and let out a howl that sounded like a mix between a cougar and Godzilla. It then became apparent what the creature was hunched over, the large-bodied corpse of a fully-grown American black bear. Its head lowered as it set its sight on the truck, letting out a visible snarl. It dropped to what appeared to be the head of the bear from its clawed left hand, as its humanoid body covered in patchy gray fur began to make its way towards me. I practically jumped into the driver's seat, threw it in reverse, and flung the truck around as fast as possible, narrowingly avoiding the creek and somehow not getting stuck in the muddied ground. However, my relief was short-lived when I saw the tree which sat in the middle of the road. I don't know if the storm toppled the large pine tree, or if the creature back near the cabin was really that powerful. I had no intentions to find out, but what choices did I have? The only road was blocked by a collapsed tree, and right behind me was this eight-foot-tall hulking monstrosity who just decapitated an adult bear. My questions would soon cease to matter as I heard the rush of water to my right. 
I got a quick glance at the brownish tsunami that had been caused by the night's torrential downpour, right before the mudslide shot down the rock face and swiftly pushing the large truck over the edge of the gorge. I must have blacked out when the truck was hit by the mudslide, because I have no memory of what happened immediately after that. What I do remember is waking up still shrouded in darkness. My ass was wet with what I assumed to be water which leaked into the truck from the mudslide. However, I soon realized that whatever I was sitting on was much different from the cushioned seat I was in previously. My vision was foggy and so was my mind, but slowly consciousness crept over me and I started to realize I was no longer in the safety of the truck. When I heard the bear earlier that night, the truck proved to be a safety blanket of sorts. I knew that as long as I was in the truck, I was protected. Well, now I was no longer in that safety blanket, and I was most certainly no longer protected. I attempted to stand up, but the ground slid out beneath me as I was standing on a bunch of marbles. A rattling followed. It was similar to the sound of sticks clacking together. I felt the ground around me and my hands instinctively found a round dry object. I picked it up and tried to figure out what it was based off feeling alone. If it was pitch black outside, wherever I was now was Vanta Black in comparison. I don't know if it was the concussion that I clearly had or just plain denial, but I knew what I was holding. I didn't want to believe it. A bone of some kind. A bone the size of a pomegranate. A bone with a dome-like structure. A bone with two eye sockets. I was not just holding a bone. I was holding a human skull. A child's skull. I dropped it immediately when I realized what I was holding. The crack that echoed through the layer made my heart sink. If that thing was in here, it definitely heard the ruckus I just caused. A few moments passed and I heard nothing. However, the light slowly began to filter in through the entrance, revealing my surroundings. There were so many bones, human and animal. The light also revealed that the walls, floor, and ceiling were all made of stone. A little drip from somewhere in the cave echoed and I started to think about the monster I'd seen earlier. I had only encountered it at night and this was clearly its home. I put two and two together and realized that thing would soon be home upon sunrise. I quickly collected myself and started rummaging around aimlessly trying to come up with a plan or find a sharp bone or something. I was in a life or death situation and my lizard brain was going full force. The beast would kill me or I would kill it. After rummaging for a few minutes, I heard yet another screech coming from outside. It wasn't in the cave yet but it was coming home soon. Right then, my eyes caught a bright green fabric of a large backpack. I scrambled through the bones and made my way over to the bag, which upon closer inspection was still attached to its owner. Needless to say, there wasn't much left of him besides the rib cage that the bag's strap was caught on. I yanked and yanked, eventually hearing the snap of the rib breaking off. As soon as the bag was in my hands, I reached for the zipper. Digging through the bag's pouches, I found some rotten food, presumably a sandwich they had packed for that day hike, some socks, an empty water bottle, and a flare gun. I let out a small yelp of excitement, thinking that I'd found what just may save my life. Just then, I heard another screech, much louder this time, pounding off the walls of the damp cavern. Just moments later, I heard the thumping of footsteps enter the cave. I did my best to recreate the position I awoke in. I didn't have time to make an elaborate plan, but I came up with something that might just save my life. My eyes were closed, but I could see it closing in on me. I held the flare gun under my back and my right hand, waiting for just the right moment. I soon felt its warm breath hit my face like a train hitting a brick wall. The stench was unbearable a combination of decomposing tissue and rotting teeth. I held my breath as best I could, but when it let out another screech point blank, I vomited a little in my mouth. I'm lucky it didn't deafen me, but the small burp I let out surely let it know I was wide awake. I opened my eyes. It roared again, spewing stinking slobber all over me. I took my chance and raised the small flare gun directly into its snout and pulled the trigger. Click. Click. Frickin' thing worked, damn it! 
I yelled in the same way one might yell a battle cry, pulling the trigger once more. The bright red flare shot instantly into the beast's mouth, soaring into the back of its throat. It staggered, clearly thrown off guard by the bizarre stun I had just pulled. It screeched. This time, however, the screech ended in a whimper, as its wolf-like head popped like a balloon. Each of its eyeballs bursted out of their sockets as red cracks began to form all over its head, and soon enough those cracks began to glow a vibrant red. I'm not ashamed to admit that I cracked a small but short-lived smile as each individual piece of the skull splattered the cave walls. I heard the antlers bounce off the stone of the cave and eventually clatter to the floor. The body wobbled as the knees grew weak under the weight of its enlarged abdomen and collapsed to the ground. I stood up, dropped the flare gun, and started to make my victorious limp to the mouth of the cave. I took one last look at the hideous remains that laid in front of me, still spewing blood out from its neck. Even though its brain matter painted all surrounding surfaces, it still made me shiver in fear. I thought of each piece flying back into place as if someone had recorded and played it in reverse. With that disturbing thought, I decided I didn't want to wait around to see if it would happen or not, so I hoppled the rest of the way out of the cave. When I got out, I looked back into the darkness one more time. No eyes peered back at me, nothing came running out to get me, it was just me and the darkness. I followed the creek and it brought me back to the spot where I had previously indulged on some delicious mountain water. With familiar surroundings around me, I began to relax somewhat but still shivered from the aftershock of adrenaline. From there, I followed the road down to where the truck had pushed over the edge. When I got there, there was still some muddy water running down the cliff in the form of a small waterfall. But for the most part, the rain had come to an end, and the wave of mud had come as quickly as it had gone. I peered over the edge and saw the bright red truck upside down about a hundred feet downhill. I thought about going down and grabbing my phone from the truck, but with my bum leg I knew it would be too risky, so I made my way back to the road by foot. By the time I reached another house, my legs were aching and my head pounded so hard I thought my skull was going to explode too. The light orange of sunrise had began to fade into the dark tone of sunset. I must have been walking for at least eight hours and I was exhausted. I made it up the four steps, knocked on the large wooden door, and collapsed. About two hours later, I awoke once again, this time in a greenish-blue bed. I was now wearing a spotted white gown, and I had an IV pumping into my arm. I instantly recognized my surroundings as a hospital and rested my head on the pillow, letting out a sign of relief. It wasn't until the next morning that I would speak with anyone. My parents drove the same long trek I did the day prior, the previous night, and got to the hospital later than they would have liked. However, they let me get my much-needed rest, and then they proceeded to grill me the next morning. Me and your mother are so, so proud of you for making it to the Henderson's property, son, and we are so thankful that you are still with us, but please tell us what happened out there. My dad's voice shook as tears formed in his eyes. I scanned the room and saw that there were two cops standing the opposite side of me, I sat up in my bed and then proceeded to tell them exactly what had happened, not leaving out one detail. They were obviously very skeptical, but I had shown up on a stranger's doorstep covered in blood that wasn't mine, and as far as they knew, I was alone up there. I felt like I needed to tell the story the way it happened, regardless of the fear of being judged, and thankfully, they believed me. A week later, I was sitting in bed with a cast, watching movies and playing video games, when my family was contacted by the police. Apparently, they had found the cave and the bones and it. They were able to match the bones to around 30 missing campers, hikers, and hunters that have been stalked, killed, and dragged into the bottom of the cave. They claimed that my encounter was actually some feral cannibal that decided to wear an animal's head on its own. That's some bullcrap, huh? Anyways, that happened around seven years ago. Nowadays, I teach biology at a community college near Seattle. That encounter changed my life forever, and not just mentally. I know the police were wrong, not because of my memory, but because I still have the foot-long scars that show its claws left on my back. After my experience, apparently they demolished the cabin to prevent other potential feral people from taking shelter there, and they gated off the road. 
My uncle passed away a few months later, but not before I got to tell him what had happened. He was astounded to hear about it, but he was aware of the cave. He told me that he had explored that cave when he was younger, only to find nothing. I recently heard of a very similar incident in Oregon not too far from where my uncle's cabin used to be. I know that whatever I encountered is long dead, but if someone else had a similar run-in, does that mean that there are more of them? I don't know for sure, but I want to find out, which is exactly why I'm going to Oregon next week to interview the victim. Three weeks ago, Cheryl Winslow was found several miles downstream from her campsite, washed ashore the Grande Ronde River near the town of Rogersburg, Oregon. While Cheryl herself didn't sustain any injuries, save for near drowning, hyperthermia, and a minor concussion, her husband Howard and her seven-year-old daughter Violet were found half-eaten and mutilated amongst the forest floor. The bottom half of the six-foot-three, 195-pound man was all that was left of him, until the police noticed his left arm dangling from a pine tree. A bloody trail followed the headless torso of the child. Police labeled it as a feral human attack, the same bullcrap excuse they gave me when I encountered the same creature that brutalized the man and his daughter. What it really is? Who knows for sure? Based off its physical appearance and lust for human blood, a lot of you seem to think that it's a wendigo. I don't know if that's true, or if it's some other chimera of a beast, but nonetheless, I'm going to refer to these creatures as wendigos, simply due to the lack of an accurate name. I appreciate the help from you guys on the last post. A lot of you provided some really insightful information on to what the creature I had encountered might have been. The main reason why Cheryl's story stuck out to me so much was that it was the only one I have heard of with such high level of brutality similar to mine. Many people report seeing cryptids walking or running between some trees in the distance, or report hearing some blood-curdling screams. While these encounters might be legitimate, the gruesomeness is what concerns me. These creatures aren't some passive cryptid, like a Bigfoot or a skunk ape. They are apex predators that will devour any living thing in their path. I had called Cheryl just before I posted the first part of my story, and she agreed to have an interview with me. I drove down to Pendleton, Oregon, two days ago, and conducted the interview. As you will see, it was... Though provoking to say the least, I recorded the conversation on my phone. Most of this will be in dialogue, so it'll essentially serve as a transcription of the interview. I know some people can be squeamish even towards textural gore, so here's your graphic content warning. Things are about to get pretty dark. Hi Cheryl, how are you today? Things have been hard lately, but today has been better than the last, so that's something I guess. You should know that it's okay not to feel okay during a time like this. I know how devastating it can be. I truly am sorry for your loss. Thank you, Peter. I really do appreciate it. Of course. So Cheryl, I want to do this in the way that respects your grieving process. I want you to start us off wherever you're comfortable. Thank you. A couple of weeks back we planned on a short camping trip. The entire hike was gorgeous. The hills are so beautiful this time of year. The day was an absolute blast. Violet caught crawdads in the river while Howard and I cooked hot dogs over a small fire by the river's shore. Hot dogs a classic. What's your wiener of choice? <laughs> Hebrew nationals. Anyways, everything was great until we started getting ready for bed. Good choice. Sorry, um, what happened when you went to bed? Howard and I put Violet to bed in her little tent, and then we began the change into our pajamas. Right after we hopped into bed, Violet came over to the front of our tent needing to go to the bathroom. Howard put on his headlamp and went with Violet into the woods to go pee. After a while, they hadn't come back, so I decided to go out looking for them. I knew which way they had gone, so I decided to put on a headlamp of my own and follow them into the forest. I probably made it about 200 feet before I noticed the flashing. I'm sorry, the flashing? Yes. I didn't know what it was at first either, but then as I got close enough for my headlamp to shine on this, this thing, 
It was horrible. It had this dark black fur and these horrible antlers. But oh god, its face. And when this thing looked at me, I saw evil incarnate. Because that's what I noticed the flashing was. It was Howard. The creature had his torso entirely inside its canine-looking mouth like a snake eating an egg. I had never been so terrified in my life, Peter. As the creature shook its muzzle, the headlamp my husband wore shook too. Christ, Cheryl, I'm, s I'm so sorry. Do you need a moment? No, it's okay. Let's just continue. Okay, but feel free to take your time. Okay. Before I turned from the creature and ran, I caught a glimpse of my daughter. I'm sorry. Maybe I do need to take a break. That's totally fine. I'll wait here. You take your time. Cheryl was very distraught to say the least. I knew she would be, as would any mother who had just lost her closest loved ones. Cheryl's story was important to me, not just because I wanted answers, but also I knew Cheryl wanted her story to be told. I should also let you all know that she consented to the release of her interview. Tears had formed in her eyes when her husband came up in the conversation, but they began pouring when Violet came into the discussion. About ten minutes later, Cheryl came back into the dining room. Okay, I... I think I'm ready. No worries, like I said. I want your grieving to be respected. You said you turned and ran from the creature when it looked at you. Oh, yeah. Although the past couple of days I've been wishing I hadn't, life has been so painful without them. But when I ran, I ended up running straight into the frigid river, hoping that whatever was behind me wasn't a great swimmer. I fell unconscious after a few minutes. Eventually, I was washed ashore nearby on the opposite side of the river. Some young couple skinny dipping in the river found me. If it wasn't for them, I would have died from hyperthermia. Wow, Cheryl. Thank you for sharing all this with me. I know how hard it could be to share a seemingly fantastical story, but I wholeheartedly believe every word you said. I appreciate you taking the time today. Do you mind if I ask you a few follow-up questions before I head out? Actually, I know you mentioned that you had an experience of your own over the phone. What happened? Oh. Uh, well, basically, I had visited an old cabin that belonged to my uncle. I agreed to help him work on it over the summer, but he suffered a heart attack a week before we were supposed to leave. I ended up going out there alone. It was admittedly a foolish thing. That night, I saw a creature in the forest. I attempted to leave the cabin in my truck, but a mudslide pushed the truck over a cliff. The creature found me unconscious and dragged me from the truck back to its cave. Jesus. Yeah, thankfully. I think they enjoyed hunting more than feeding on the dead. It left me in its cave as it went back out to hunt. In a deuce, my ex-machina type movement, I found an older flare gun in the backpack belonging to one of the creature's previous victims. When it came back, I shot the flare gun in its throat, its head. Wait, you killed it? Somehow, yeah I did. I don't know how I got so lucky. Screw this. If you killed that one, I bet we could kill the one that took my Howie and Violet. Wait, Cheryl, you can't be serious. These things possesses otherworldly levels of aggression and capability for violence. I know you're angry, but I can't let you put your life in harm's way after you barely got away once. I have nothing left, Peter. Nothing. My parents both died from cancer and my younger brother was killed in a car crash two years ago. Howard and Violet were the only family I had. I'm not asking you to come with me. All I needed to know is that these things bleed. I stopped the recording there. After several futile attempts to keep Cheryl from getting herself killed, I offered to go out to Hell's Canyon with her to hunt this thing. No known cave systems exist near the Winslow's campsite, but Hell's Canyon is home to dozens of caverns. Cheryl is hoping that we find the right one. I don't know what I'm in for. Stay tuned. I'll make sure to up you guys when I get back from our expedition. If... We make it back.
Before I tell you what happened out in Hell's Canyon, it is with great sadness that I must tell you it is not Peter narrating this story. It is I, Cheryl Winslow. I hold a great deal of guilt. It was my fault that Peter went out there in the first place. It was my fault that he didn't make it back. Peter was worried about something that might end up happening, so he gave me his account information just in case I made it back alive. I'm sorry. This is all my fault. Upon Peter's departure from my house here in Pendleton, I contacted a couple friends of mine, Rita, an old college pal, and an expert hunter who also knew Hell's Canyon like the back of her tattooed hand, as well as Kenneth, a mercenary-type militant that used to be one of my husband's co-workers. He's a kook, but I knew we would need some firepower out there. Just after the interview was published, we met up at Dallas and loaded into my Jeep Cherokee heading for the border of Oregon and Idaho. Hell's Canyon is absolutely gorgeous. I would highly recommend going out to visit if you ever get the chance, but as you may soon discover, it might not be the vacation spot it was once considered to be. We followed a winding dirt road through the hillsides which eventually led us into a wooded valley surrounding the Snake River that Rita suggested we take. She said that it looked promising. Boy, was she right. I hopped out of the driver's seat and swung the heavy black door shut. Y'all ready? Rita looked at me, raising an eyebrow as if to question my intelligence. Y'all? Really, Cheryl? What, are we in frickin' Louisiana? She said with a grin on her face, while pulling out a hunting rifle and a box of .308 ammunition from the car. Peter chimed in. Hey, this is serious. We're here. It's go time. We can't be dicking around. It could cost us our lives. These animals aren't anything to be taken lightly. Kenneth spoke up while loading the 12-gauge Winchester pump shotgun. What's wrong with Louisiana, Rita? My mama was born on the bay -o, you know. He cocked his shotgun, expelling a red shotgun slug as he spit out the moist brown glob of Copenhagen he had been chewing on. Rita glanced at me yet again, obviously suspicious of the gun-tuning redneck I had invited. Of course she was. She scoffed and began loading the large rounds into her own rifle. We gonna have an issue, missy? Kenneth said, still glaring at Rita. Frustrated. Rita turned away from the car as she pulled the metal bolt of the matte black rifle back, chambering around. Nope. Her shortness enforcing the notion that they would, in fact, have an issue. Come on, guys. Let's get going. We're already behind schedule, Peter said sternly, slinging his pack over his right shoulder. Reaching out, he pulled a Colt M 1911 from a hand Kenneth had extended in his direction, holstering it immediately. Where's mine, Kenny? I asked him, implying that I was eager to get my hands on a firearm as well, something that would almost never occur at any other point in my life. Kenneth reached both arms into the back of the Cherokee. He let out a muffled grunt as he retrieved something from the trunk. Well, Miss Cheryl, this one I brought just for you. Grinning ear to ear, he then revealed an AR-15 equipped with a holographic sight and a foregrip. Jesus Christ, what is this, frickin' desert storm? Rita shouted. Kenneth, now visibly irritated, snapped back. Do you see any ragheads around here? This sent my one-fourth Pakistani, although you could hardly tell, friend into a fight of rage. What did you just say, you son of a... You might have some big guns, but I could kill you with my bare frickin' hands, you inbred prick. Before a fist or a firefight could break out... Peter stepped in between the two polar opposites, raising his arms. Knock this crap off, you two. You're gonna have to set your differences aside if we're going to make it out of this forest alive. Lowering his arms and shaking his head, Peter scuffed as he began the trek into the woods. Come on, let's move. Rita and Kenneth gave each other one final glare before we put on our packs, following after Peter. Eventually... Rita took the lead. Being our Hell's Kitchen expert, she led our single-file line of misfits through the woods. Behind her was Peter, behind Peter was me, and behind me was Kenneth. 
Despite the two's altercation earlier on, Rita and Kenneth managed to suck down their pride, most likely due to Peter's intimidating tone. After all, he was the only one who had managed to kill one of these creatures. If anyone knew what we were up against, it was him. Rita led us down towards the edge of the Snake River and turned around to face us. All right, the first cave is about a half a mile south of here. Are you guys sure you're ready? I could tell that Rita had began questioning the safety of our hunting trip. Yep, it's now or never. Let's do this, I replied, faking as much confidence as I could. I nodded my head and Rita began to guide us southbound towards the cavern. We walked in silence, but fear was plaguing all of our hearts. After 20 minutes of trooting through thick brush and brabble, the wooded area opened up, revealing a rock faced with a small pitch black gap just barely large enough to crawl into. Kenneth stopped in his tracks and threw his hands up in the air. Oh, hell no. I'm not going up in that freaking hole. Rita, instantly recognizing this opportunity, replied sarcastically. Don't be a wussy, Kenny. Simultaneously glaring and grinning at Kenneth. Kenneth plopped his semi-overweight bottom down on a nearby rock, set his shotgun on the ground and leaned back, putting his hands behind his head. You are what you eat. A smug grin grew on his face as we all let out an audible groan. Peter, not wanting to give Kenneth any attention, began to debrief us. Okay, whatever. Kenny, you just stay here. I guess you could just keep watch. You two, let's get our headlamps on and do this thing. Sweat dribbled down the side of Peter's head, possibly from the warm, thick air, possibly from the fear of what was yet to come. Rita and I nodded in agreement as we sat down our packs and reached into the top pockets, pulling out LED headlamps with black straps. Yes, sir, Rita replied as she strapped her lamp on. Let's do this. Rita once again led our descent into the dark cavern, hunting rifle on her back swaying as she crawled through the small opening. After a few minutes of claustrophobic crawling, muffled groans, and several scrapes which had accumulated on our arms, the cavern expanded. Peter pulled a red flare gun from his back pocket. Upon striking the flare, the damp cave was illuminated with a bright red light. Here we are. Peter declared, pulling the handgun from his leather holster and sliding the hammer back, double-checking that the pistol was in fact loaded. Rita swung the hunting rifle from her back and into the palms of her hands. So, what do we do if we see one of these things? Peter's straight face turned around and answered Rita's question. Shoot it. Till it drops to the frickin' floor. He turned back again and began to lead us further down into the cave. Eventually, we came across a solid rock wall blocking any further movement. Shoot. Dead end, I said, frustrated that we hadn't found what we were looking for, relieved that we hadn't found our demise. Back to square one, Peter said, letting out a sign as he began to trudge back up the mouth of the cave. We successfully managed to crawl out of the cave and back into the bright eastern Oregon sunshine. However... As we exited the cave, all three of us immediately noticed something. Kenneth was gone. Peter, cupping his hands around his mouth, began shouting into the woods. Kenny! 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 Where are you? Crap. Just then, something cracked on the forest floor. We all swerved around immediately. Walking out from beneath the dark canopy was a six-foot-tall figure. It was Kenneth. Zipping up his dirty jeans and presumably wiping piss off of his blue denim, he cracked a smile and exclaimed, You didn't think one of those beats got me, did ya? Jeez, Kenny, what the hell? I yelled, furious that he hadn't even peed closer to the cave or just held it in. Rita rolled her eyes. Oh, thank goodness. She responded, once again slinging the rifle behind her back. I did the same. After the initial mission, we investigated five more similar limestone caverns to no avail before setting up camp for the night. We had found a small clearing in the woods and unrolled our sleeping bags. 
lit a small campfire, and began to discuss our next move. Peter sat on a log near the fire, pulling out a can of warm Pabst Blue Ribbon from his pack. He began brainstorming. There's a crap ton of caverns in this area. It could take weeks, maybe months, before thoroughly exploring each one of them. Maybe we should just call it a trip and head out in the morning. We could always potentially come back after we do some more research. He sipped the warm beer, grimacing. Forget that. We have plenty of supplies. We could stay out here for at least a week before we need to head back into town. I'm not leaving until we find something. I frantically replied, my mind clouded with the thought of revenge, not heeding the warning Peter had given us. <sighs> Makes no difference to me. I'll take any opportunity to spend a night underneath the night sky. Rita laid on top of her insulated blue sleeping bag. Standing up, she declared, Hey, I have to pee. I'll be right back. We all turned towards her. Are you sure you want to go alone? I asked, remembering what had happened earlier with Kenneth. She nodded her head. Her thick brown hair bobbed along as it illuminated by the orange light of the campfire. Yeah, I have a shy bladder. Pete, can I take your colt with me? Prefer to be caught with my pants down holding a handgun rather than scrambling for my bolt action. Yeah, sure. Here you go. Peter stood up from his log and leaned towards Rita, handing her the small silver hand cannon. Thanks. I'll be right back. Save a beer for me, Rita asked, smiling before heading into the woods. Peter raised his white can in her direction. You got it. Just like that, my friend had vanished into the darkness of the thick wooded region. She had grown up with divorced parents, her mom taught her the ways of activism and strength through feminism, while her dad taught her the ways of being a hunter and strength through nature. I trusted her to be on her own even more so than Kenneth, our resident militant. Speaking of the gun nut, Kenneth had set his shotgun against the side of a pine tree and zipped open his large green pack, pulling out a small yellow cooler. We could stay here a couple of nights, but I think we need to go back to town to rethink our strategy. If we're going to find anything, this is the easiest and least efficient way to do so, Peter said while taking another sip of his beer and staring at the pine needle riddled ground. I sighed, sucking down my pride. Yeah, maybe that's not the worst idea. I kicked at the ground, sending clumps of dirt sap towards the campfire. Kenneth pulled a square yellow plastic package from his cooler. Ripping open the package, he pulled out a stick of cold meat out and slid it onto a stick he had sharpened with a pocket knife, raising it above the crackling flame as it began to sizzle. Shoot. Not a bad idea, Kenny, Peter said, while also reaching into his pack, pulling out a small Ziploc baggie with a turkey sandwich inside. You should eat, Cheryl. You'll need the calories. Peter held out half the sandwich in my direction. Accepting the small meal, I replied softly, Thanks. Are you sure we ain't just hunting a lost grizzly? Kenneth questioned, slowly looking up from the fire towards me. Infuriated, I laid into him. What the hell, Kenny? You and Howard were close friends. You're going to sit here and say that a bear did... did that to him? Screw off. You've been nothing but intolerable this entire frickin' excursion. I don't even know why I asked you to tag along. I moved my gaze from Kenneth's alarmed face to the dirt ground beneath my feet. Dang, well, sorry, is all that Kenneth could say before the sound that could only be described as an audible version of a holocaust rattled through the forest. Peter dropped the sandwich in shock and scanned the forest as Kenneth's face grew ghostly pale. We then turned to face the thudding coming from behind us. We all swung our bodies towards the stomping, and in similar fashion as earlier in the day, Rita bursted through the dark forest edge. Panting, Riva bent over and pulled her hands over her knees. Holy crap! What the hell was that? Frozen in fear, none of us had time to answer her as the hulkish, shadowy mass slowly formed behind my dear old friend. The same shadowy mass that killed my husband and daughter. Confused as to why we hadn't responded, Rita began. What's... what's... Before she was interrupted. A large, furry, brown-clawed hand with the palm the size of a dinner plate wrapped its razor-sharp talons around Rita's skull. 
She barely had time to scream or fight back before the thing twisted her head off her spine like the cap of a beer bottle. Her lifeless body fell to the ground with a loud thud. Her head, eyes rolled back, still in the clutches of the beast's left hand. The monster tightened its grip around Rita's skull. A wet crunch let out through the air as her head was reduced to pink mush lined with dark hair. Oh crap, let's get out of... Kenneth shouted. But before he could even think to stand up, a pair of antlers, which resembled a Norwegian black metal band's logo, bursted through his ribcage. Being raised up in the air, his flailing body vomited up few globs of blood before the second beast, with gray fur, stood up at the towering ten feet tall, pulling him from its antlers and ripping him in half vertically like a piece of fleshy construction paper. Blood showering Peter and I, as the droplets collided with the campfire, a quick sizzle escaped the hot orange flame. The six-foot-long halves of Kenneth dropped to the ground, squishing and expelling more gore from his insides. Peter dove for Kenny's Winchester, which still laid upon the nearby tree. Cheryl, start running! Peter shouted in my direction, while he grabbed the shotgun and aimed it for the gray monstrosity that now lunged at him. Peter pulled the shotgun's trigger, nailing the creature in its left shoulder, staggering as it let out a harsh screech. The blood coursing through my veins had been replaced with dread, but nonetheless I took this opportunity and made my mad dash into the direction of the car. It was over two miles away, but it was the only chance of escape we had. Peter followed, as so did the brown creature, eventually followed by the gray one once it had regained its balance. AR-15 pounding against my back, I sprinted through the forest, crunching twigs and leaves as I dodged thick tree trunks in the night's shroud of darkness. After making it about 150 feet, I foolishly took a peek over my shoulder just in time to see the same large brown hand reaching for my head as it did Rita's. Eyes widened with terror, the palm at the top of my skull, plucking me off the ground as if I was an ant. I screamed, kicked, and swatted at the creature as it licked its muzzle with a long, wet, purple tongue. In an instant, accompanied by a blinding flash and a deafening crack, the creature's cranium was tore from its skull as a slug left the barrel of the Winchester, sending me onto my ass and its lifeless body onto the ground. Freaking go, shall run! Peter demanded towards me as a large gray hand grabbed him by his upper leg and dangled him in the air. With a swift rip, the creature had gripped Peter's shoulder and separated his torso from his legs, splitting his internals onto the ground with a sickening plop. Peter met his gruesome fate because I chose to go out there. The guilt I feel is immeasurable. All three of my friends have been murdered by these beasts, and I wasn't going to go down without a fight. I reached behind my back and yanked the high-powered assault rifle into my hands, left hand on the foregrip and the right index finger on the trigger. With a mix of rage, terror, and self-preservation, I let out a shrill scream as my finger rapidly pressed down on the heavy trigger, sending out dozens of rounds flying out of the barrel and into the forest. Not one hit the creature, at least not until the final click did a round leave the chamber and soar directly into the creature's right eyeball. The eye erupted, spewing blood and optic fluid like a volcano of gore, as the thing let out the worst noise I'd ever heard. Now holding its bloody eye with its right hand, the thing snarled at me one more time before trotting back into the darkness on all fours whimpering. I wish I could have stayed and moored my dear friends, but I knew that I couldn't let their deaths be meaningless. I had to make it out of Hell's Canyon alive. By the time I made it back to the car, it was dawn. The gentle blues and oranges reflected off the windshield of my black Jeep Cherokee. Thankfully, I remembered to attach the car keys to a carabiner and clipped it to my belt. I removed the keys and opened the car door. As I put the keys into the ignition and thought of my friend's corpses swam through my mind. I drove to the closest ranger station and let them know what had happened. Simultaneously and dumbfounded and suspicious, they went out to where I had just left. Hours passed before they came back. Ultimately, they couldn't figure out what had happened. There were no remains found of either my friends or the monster. 
just four red grease marks on the forest floor. I wish I could give you a happy ending to this story. I wish I could tell you it's safe to go into the woods, but I cannot in good faith do either. I'm sorry for all of this. Please, beware the creatures that roam eastern Oregon. They've taken everything from me, and they'll just as quickly take everything from you.